I'm Josh Hartwell. I'm Heather Beasley. And this is Betsy Intergenerations. Normally we have two different generations. Uh, this session we have one. Um, we've met for eight weeks and given our writers some writing exercises and talked about basic terms and how to write specifically for the stage. In the fourth week of the program, uh, participants in the class have an opportunity to interview one another and explore some interesting questions together. What they learn about their each other's life experiences inspires the short plays that you are about to see today. So you will see seven world premiere readings, gently rehearsed and trusted to our talented ensemble of actors. Thank you so much for joining us today. And without further ado, on with the show. Nineteen seventies New York City, the squeak and hum of a subway. The lights flicker a couple of times before they come up on a heavily advertised and graffitied subway car. The squeal of a stop and the hiss of subway doors. A recorded voice announces the doors are about to shut. Lydia pulls Gina by the arm. They enter the train just before the doors shut. The train jerks forward. I cannot believe you just flashed that man. <laughs> they flop into two seats in a row of four. I didn't flash anyone. I just kind of pushed them up a bit. <laughs> Did you see the way he was staring and what was his wife beside him? Absolutely shameful. I thought they'd die. I thought they'd both die. <laughs> him of embarrassment, her of jealousy. <laughs> Jesus, Jean. <laughs> what else are we gonna do on a Wednesday night? Homework? Well, that's what we told my mom we'd be doing. Speak for yourself. I told your mom we were riding the subway to check out the man tree. Dude, I heard you while I was curling my hair. You've got to stop talking to her like that. You came right out with it. <laughs> like a joke. She thought I was joking. Oh, hey, Mrs. M. I'm here for Lydia. We're going to ride the subway on Prowl for handsome young men. <laughs> this way, when we get busted, I can claim I told her so. Besides, she did the same thing when she was our age. She did not. My Nana told me my mom was a goody two-shoes. Unlike her daughter, the harlot. Oh, don't even. Oh, <laughs> and I can tell you've been boning up on your vocabulary, harlot. <laughs> <laughs> you said boning. The squeal of a stop and the hiss of subway doors opening, Andre enters and stands right over Gina, holding the overhead rail. A recorded voice announces the doors are about to shut. They do, the train jerks forward. Hey, you're in my intro to lit class, right? Uh, NYU. Yeah, yeah, right, with Mr. Uh, Professor Drebeck. Yeah, God, yeah, Professor Drebeck. I'm Gina. Andre. And this is Lydia. She's at Princeton though, studying human sexuality. She's shy about it. What with all the research. Cool. Uh, what are you ladies up to tonight? I'm flashing married men on subway cars. It's her research project. You married? Uh, uh no. Oh, wrong answer. Right, Lid? <laughs> I was just thinking, my buddy Stefan, he's really cool, like, and he's got this apartment in the East Village with a fire escape, there's a jug of wine, oh, and uh, he, he's a member of the Warner Music Club, so he gets all the best albums shipped right to his door. He's got, um, he, he's got the new Steve Miller. You like Steve Miller? Oh, yeah. Steve Miller is her favorite. Or maybe it's Glenn Miller. Barney Miller, perhaps? I'm more about the disco. What's that Steve Miller song you like, Lid? Uh. Really love your peaches? Wanna shake your tree? Yeah, man, it's so like, it's so good. That's it, that's the one. The squeal of a stop and the hiss of a subway doors opening. Andre looks out the window. When the doors open, Andre heads for the doors. 
I'll, I'll be right back. It, don't go anywhere. They watch as Andre runs by the doors in one direction, then the other. Gina's got a boyfriend. Gina's got a boyfriend. <laughs> he isn't hard on the eyes. I'll give him that. I can't believe he thinks you're in college. Please. He doesn't think I'm in college. It's a line is all. He saw my peaches and now he wants to shake my tree. <laughs> a recorded voice announces the doors are about to shut. Andre jumps back on just before they do. The train jerks forward. So, what do you think? About... Uh, my buddy Stefan and us, the four of us, and the drug wine, and his fire escape, and you know, the Steve Miller band. Oh, that. <laughs> it's funny, because I asked him, can I bring anything? And he says, yeah, uh, bring two hot chicks. So then I get on this particular car, and bam, <laughs> two hot chicks. So what do you say? Tell us more about this Stefan character. He's like, he's like the coolest guy I know. He's studying philosophy. Um, he thinks deeper than anyone I ever met. I mean, like anyone I met personally. He's like a beat poet, except, you know, more now. <laughs> huh. Dare I say he sounds just like Lydia's type. Yeah? Oh yeah. Lydia writes poetry and she once got beat up in Brooklyn. So you could say she's an authentic beat poet. <laughs> Ain't that right, Lyd? She's humble about it is the thing. East Village, huh? It's like the sixth floor of a high rise. The view is, is, Bam! Ha! <laughs> you in? I think we would love to. The squeal of a stop and the hiss of subway doors opening. Andre looks out the window. When the doors open, Andre heads for the doors. Hold that thought. Andre runs by the window in one direction and then the other. Well, we should, right? Now you're talking. But we don't know them at all. And if anything happened, nobody would know. And now you're talking. No, I, we should. We should. One glass of wine, right? We like them. We said another date. It's that easy. Now you're talking. It doesn't seem like a serial killer. And now... We got each other's backs, though. Even if we haven't met the other one. Deal. One drink. Then we're out of there faster than the average hunk could shake a tree. <laughs> a recorded voice announces the doors are about to shut. Andre jumps back on just before they do. The train jerks forward. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, about that. Uh, why do you keep hopping off the train, running in both directions, then hopping back on at the last second? Lydia thinks you've got the gas, but you don't want us to know about it. Keeping the contrail out of the concourse, I think it's rather noble of you. <laughs> what? Nah, man. It's actually kind of funny. Um, it's about Stefan. Uh, see, his friend is going to San Fran tomorrow, and we're up in Hill's Kitchen at a bar, you know, to send him off. And Stefan, there was whiskey involved, was headed home, and he kind of called me from a payphone to say he had to get off to the train to uh, get some fresh air and he was gonna take a little nap on a bench. And could I find him and bring him home for the party? <laughs> that is funny. Get it, Liv? So we're having a party with your drunk friend, Stefan. He left, I don't know, two hours ago. Uh, he's probably like 70% sober now. Yeah, Lid. He's only 30% drunk. Do the math, huh? No, if he's 70% sober, he's still 100% drunk. God, I hate math. Uh, no, but really, uh, he'll be cool. Um, just, just meet him first. Um, you'll see. Sure, we can meet. 
Stefan some other time. I've got boobs to flash. She's got notes to take. Bad timing is all. Nah, man. You'll you'll see when I find him. He's totally cool. The squeal of a stop and the hiss of subway doors opening. Andre looks out the window. When the doors open, Andre heads for the doors. This is going south fast, Gene. You sounded like the mafioso just now. This is going fast, Gene. <laughs> we'll meet him. We'll meet 70% sober, sober Stefan, then we'll decide. What have we got to lose besides our dignity and I don't know, side chance, mind you, our lives. Do you really think that- Andre walks to the train doors slowly, arms hanging. His white t-shirt is stained, all brown orange on one shoulder and all down the front. He just hurled all over me. Oh my <sighs> God, I can smell that from here. Oh, cripes, it's like a subway rat ate a pound of sauerkraut and then your friend Stefan washed that rat down with a bottle of Mad Dog, let it simmer for, I don't know, two hours? And then <coughs> all over poor Andre. A recorded voice announces the doors are about to shut. Andre steps forward, dejected. He stops in the doorway, causing the doors to beep in protest. Whoa. Whoa, buddy, you can't come in here smelling like that. What am I supposed to do? I got an uncle who manages a car wash on Staten Island. Oh, what about the party? The, the fire escape? You know what? We'll talk about it after prof... Dear Tux... Drebex. Drebex class. Tomorrow. Andre, defeated, backs out of the doorway. The door is shut and the train jerks forward. <laughs> oh, and thus departs the former future Mr. Gina Collins. <laughs> oh, poor lad will never know how much he's missing. And to think, you almost married a lush. Good thing I had your back. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Let's get ourselves home, huh? We've tempted the fates enough for one night. The lights flicker a couple of times, then go black. The squeak of wheels fades to silence. End of play. Lights come up on the set. Bob is standing behind a cooking island. Placed neatly on the large island are various sizes of wooden bowls and various large glass bowls. There are kitchen utensils on the counter, a variety of sizes of knives, whisks, and cutting boards. To one side are plastic bags full of groceries. Bob is going through the groceries, decanting mushrooms, onions, blocks of cheese, tomatoes, and all sorts of other vegetables, as well as eggs from their store containers into the wooden bowls. Off stage, the front door of the house slams. Rose? Rose enters the kitchen. Did you stub your toe or something? No. Oh, okay, good. He puts the wooden bowl of onions in a glass bowl in front of her, slides a nine inch chef's knife and a paring knife her way. I am glad you're home early. As you can see, I am getting started a wee bit late. Don't you want to know why I'm home early? Well, they didn't cancel the auditions, did they? No didn't cancel the auditions. Okay, so... Guess who showed up? Lisa Morgan. Lisa Morgan, 11 years ago, the woman who fired me. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, your director at that fresh start place. It just took me a second to remember that it has been 11 years. Wait a minute, she, she fired you? I, I thought that she- Strolled in. I recognized her immediately and the intervening 11 years just evaporated. I was shocked at how suddenly my anger welled up. 
like a rose blooming it fast forward. I don't think that's an appropriate metaphor. That's like a beautiful image, you know, but, but anger, anger would, anger would ignite like a match. It, it, it was like a rose blooming. He pours two glasses of wine and hands one to her. Okay, because your name is Rose and your anger. Exactly. So I'm standing there staring at her and she starts looking around the room and sees me and recognizes me. She looks a bit surprised, but not embarrassed or disconcerted at all. She smiles as if at an old friend. And without hesitation, she walks over to me and says, hi, how have you been? As cheerful as you please, as if the last time I'd seen her, she hadn't fired me. You keep saying that she fired you. I, I don't- or Resigned or fired. That was the ultimatum not the point. Oh, the point is, I couldn't think of a single thing to say. Well, I could think of a plenty of things to say, but none of which I thought I should say, if you get my drift. So I think I said, oh, fine. How have you been? Oh, thank God for conversational cliches. And she's looking around the room and she says, there's a lot of people here. I didn't know what to expect before I could say anything. Doug waves me over, so I say, oh, the director's waving at me, excuse me, or something like that anyway. And I walk away from her and I go over to Doug. Okay, good, so. She finishes her wine and pours herself a refill. And then she comes over to us. Doug's barely got time to get out a sentence or two. And then I see his eyes move to behind my shoulder and I turn around and there she is. You're the director, she says. This is the first time I've ever been auditioning for anything and I'd like to talk to you about the process. No acknowledgement that I was there. No, excuse me, typical of her behavior. Oh. I cannot tell you what I wanted to say at that moment. But Doug was so polite. He says, sure, and catch you in a few minutes, Rose, and walks away with her. Well, that was pretty rude. And that kicked the anger up another notch. I can tell you, the rose finished blooming. The petals turned black and floated to the floor like... <clears throat> That like, metaphor, it really doesn't work. Oh, is it a metaphor or a simile? Or whatever it is, it, it doesn't work. Oh, fine. I'm starting not to like it either. So anyway, I'm thinking, what should I do? I am <laughs> nice. so angry. I'd have had to have been a Tony award-winning actress to stay in the room and act like I didn't want to kill her. She stabs the knife into the basket of onions as if into a person. So I left. She lifts up an impaled onion, removes the onion from the knife and starts to slice it with the practiced way of an experienced chef. Bob starts working on the mushrooms, cutting them into quarters. Well, that's turned out to be a good thing. I was a little bit worried about how long this prep work was going to take. Is that all you have to say? Well, honey, we, we do have guests coming tonight. All right, all right. But you can chop and talk, can't you? Is that all you have to say? Well, if you want to know, I guess I'm kind of surprised. You're, you're still angry about it? Really angry, apparently. It's been 11 years, right? I have a right to be angry. You don't think I have a right to be angry? Of course, you have a right to be angry, but I'm just surprised you are. Bob, this woman didn't just force me out, as well as a lot of my colleagues. All of us, with years of experience, dozens of clients we had worked with over the years who trusted us and counted on us, but even after we left, oh, she made such a mess of the place. 
she literally drove it into the ground, leaving that community to look for help, many of them desperately for many months. Some of them I'm sure even gave up. It was devastating to them and it was devastating to us and it was devastating to me. And you're surprised that seeing this woman has rebirthed the anger in me? But you, you're a psychotherapist. Yes, I am aware of that. So what are you saying? You help people overcome anger and grief issues all the time, right? So I would have expected you to be able to, you know, just shrug it off, that's all. I may be a psychotherapist, a good psychotherapist, but I'm still human. I still get angry at, at injustice and bullies and at the shenanigans of people with narcissistic personality disorders. That term fits her to a T, by the way. And it would be nice if my husband would show me some sympathy some support. Rose, I have supported you your whole career. 11 years ago, the economy was kind of tough, wasn't it? Money was tight. But when you came and you mentioned to me that you'd become burnout at fresh start and you'd resigned to explore new avenues, did I say a word? Hmm, damn. I'd forgotten I'd put it like that. No one likes to admit they've been fired. I did resign, but only because that would look better on a resume than being let go. I admit. Okay, okay, we won't argue semantics, but let us not forget that it was me. After I thought you'd resigned from your own very good, very well-paying job of your own accord, who suggested that you explore the possibilities of the telemental health industry. Which launched me into a very successful new career. Yes. Well, there you go. Yeah, yeah. I accused you unjustly this time. I'm sorry, Bob. Don't be sorry. Chop. You know what you should do? You should take this rage and channel it into something constructive. That, that mystery play you've always been wanting to write, if you could only decide on a plot, well, here is your plot. Great minds think alike. I recorded it on my phone on the way home. The idea of the play, some dialogue. It's me and 11 of my former colleagues. And we're at this scrumptious, large and luxuriously appointed conference center to attend a seminar on the latest techniques in psychotherapy. And in she walks. Turns out she's in charge of the conference center and we realize she's driving it into the ground too. So we plot to take justice into our hands. The only thing is, there is a snowstorm and we are snowed in. So we have to decide, do we go through with it or not? And then we figure out that there's a contingent of police officers there on a training course. So we need to figure out a plot to outsmart them. One where every single one of us has an alibi and she stabbed 12 times like a jury. Uh, my darling, <laughs> you do know that Yes. Yes, I know. <laughs> no one does it better than Agatha Christie. And why are they doing a remake of the movie of Murder on the Orient Express when the Albert Finney version is perfect? You can still do it. Just drop the 12 killers and the execution by Jor... No, no. Keep on with the Agatha Christie theme only have your characters segue through all her murder methods one by one as the difficulties of pulling off your nefarious crime start to pile up until you're finally at the end of And Then There Were None. No, no. It's all right. I'm not going to do anything with this little gem. I dictated this in the white heat of anger and for the whole drive home, the creative juices 
derivative as they were, were really flowing. In fact, it was really incredible how creative I felt. But just when I got into the house, it dawned on me that I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to write this kind of play, cathartic as it was, just another play about people reacting violently instead of in a mature manner to one of life's never ending problems. Well, you were still angry when you came in here, massacring those defenseless vegetables. <laughs> well, most of that anger was directed at you. Oh, I see. Well, it's kind of a pity though. You really could do something with that plot of yours. It's just, for the past year or more, I've so often turned off the TV after the news and thought to myself, this world is drowning in tears. I think that's been my stumbling block all this time. I love those mysteries where the only person who dies is someone everyone hates including the reader. Give me a good detective story by Agatha Christie or Dorothy Sayers any day of the week. I'll tell you why I like mysteries so much. It's because a psychotherapist is like a detective, am I right? In a mystery, something has happened that tears apart the fabric of society or, or, or puts the world of the characters out of order. How embarrassing, I, I can't remember, can't remember the exact quote anymore, but, it, but it, it's from Julian Simmons. No, maybe Jacques Barzun. Damn, any, anyway, the detective comes in, solves the crime, and brings order back to the universe. And that's exactly what you do with your clients. Find out what's going on and, and bring order back to their lives. And that is why you could convey in your mystery play, Murder by Christie. That's a good title. It's a good title. And a good lighthearted plot, but I don't really want to do it. It's just, in real life, the people or the person who is dead is so often someone who someone else loves. And there's grief and suffering and mind numbing misery. Now, when I think back on my favorite books, in, in my mind's eye, I can't help but add in some human emotions to those stock characters and think about how much they'd be suffering if it were real life. So I don't want to write any kind of mystery at all. I, frankly, I want to write something that can help bring people together, people laughing with each other, giving joy to each other, a, a joyous play. That's, that's what I want to write. Okay, so what genre? Comedy, not my forte, I admit, but- Whoa, <laughs> Comedy. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, you're witty and- I've heard you say the occasional laugh out loud funny line, but I'm kind of wondering if you could write three acts worth of funny. Even two would be a stretch. Thank you for that. Well, I could collaborate with someone who could provide the comedy. Why are you looking at me? You, you think I could write three acts of funny? It could be. It could be about a husband and wife, foodies in their kitchen, arguing over the best ways to cook each dish, or, um, or we could get very existential about it. Two foodies trying to write a play about two foodies trying to write a play about the best way to cook every dish or which cuisine is better or something. That way, if we ran out of something to say in the actual play, we could pad it out with action in the framing of the play. <laughs> well, I've sometimes wondered if that is why people write plays within plays, cheating on the page count. In any event, other foodies might enjoy that, but. I don't think the idiosyncrasies of chefs or, or wannabe chefs are the ingredients for a joy giving comedy. Ha ha. I see what you did there. 
on the other hand, all comedy is joy giving, isn't it? Not the comedy where the laughs come at the expense of other people, obviously, but hell, why, why not write a play about two wannabe chefs? Make it funny, get it done. And, and after we've got one play under our belts, the next one will be easier. Let's do it. You'll help me write it. Yes, and I even have an idea for the plot. Husband and wife, rival chefs, bickering while time marches on and their guests are about to walk in on them and a bunch of delightfully piquant piles of raw vegetables. That would not be funny. Let's start galloping, Mr. Gourmet. End of play. Lights come up on Joan sitting in an easy chair in her living room. She has a big book on her lap. It's an anthology of Shakespeare's plays, uh, but we don't have to know that. She's reading but stops to rub her eyes as if she's tired. A bell rings. Oh, Mom, I'll be there soon. It's not dinner time yet. Goes back to reading. Then something some somewhat mumbles as if she is nodding off while putting her head against the chair back. All the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. I wonder what part I'd be. James enters. He's wearing clothing reminiscent of the original Star Trek. Whoa. What the, oh, what, who? Ah, sorry. Sorry, I, I was supposed to materialize outside your door so I could knock. Sometimes this transporting isn't exact. I'm Captain James T. Kirk of the Starship Enterprise, and I've come to take you boldly where no man has gone before, or woman. Anyway, you are the winner of the Beam Me Up Scotty Fan Fiction Contest. We received your submission. But I sent that in several years ago. I, I don't even remember what I wrote. I never heard back. Figured it was lost in space. Well, it takes time to get through all the galaxy red tape, but you've won the adventure of your dreams, whatever they are. It is my job to make that happen. So, what are your dreams? Uh, wait a second. Uh, who put you up to this? I bet it was Susie at work. She knows I've been a Trekkie and she has a weird sense of humor. <laughs> But how did you get in? I know I locked that door. I understand why you might not believe me, but I am Captain Kirk. Here, I'll prove it. He talks into the communicator, which looks like a cell phone. The lady doesn't believe me. Beam me up a little. Hmm. That didn't work. Must be the electromagnetic field. But I'm sure you recognize this. Uh, breathe. Well, I don't smell any alcohol. I hope you aren't stoned. But I think you need a chair, so sit. Thank you. This beaming seems to have made me unstable. There's a clunk from upstairs. Do you have ghosts? Extraterrestrials upstairs? No, that's my dad and his walker. I take care of my parents. A noble pursuit. So, tell me your dream adventure. Unfortunately, we need to be quick. This Beaming transport is making me even more unstable. Is this really happening? I, I feel like Alice down the rabbit hole. Okay, if Susie set this up, I'll play along. I need some moments of fun in my life. My dream is to see all of Shakespeare performed in New York or London or both. Would you be an actor? Not at all. I would freeze up and they'd have to pull me off the stage with one of those old fashioned canes. But I love theater, the words, the costumes feel transported to another world. Someday I might even like to write plays myself. There was a time when my brother would come to town and we'd go and see all of these plays and it was wonderful, but he doesn't do that anymore. It was a while ago. Oh, I could do even better. You can really be transported. Come with me to meet old Will in his home in Stratford, watch him in the 1500s in England. We can travel around the countryside, watch his plays, See men play women's parts, ha <laughs> ha. You, you could wear those beautiful Eliz Elizabethan dresses and I could be your beau. <laughs> Did you ever see Shakespeare in love? Suppose you could be my muse and 
I'd be jealous. <laughs> he could write a play about that. Or maybe you and Shakespeare could collaborate, writing plays with Shakespeare. Oh, wow, what an amazing thing to think mm -hmm. about, writing with Shakespeare. Oh, to be or not to be, oh, I can't even imagine. <laughs> Or Shakespeare writing a play about me? Oh, I wonder what role he'd write for me. <laughs> it stands as if imagining, swirling around, caught up in the moment. A queen, a fairy, a rebellious wench. Oh, I'm definitely not the Juliet type. Oh, who would play me? <laughs> he catches herself a bit embarrassed. Oh, well, um, if I really believed you. <laughs> I don't know, wouldn't it be kind of smelly? No indoor plumbing, diseases, lots of mud, icky stuff in the streets, no baths. Where's your sense of adventure? Oh. It would be fascinating to see Shakespeare writing with a quill pen, see his plays in their original form. But even if for a moment I could believe your transport beaming program doesn't seem to be working so well, could you guarantee that I'd get back here in one piece? Well, sometimes a person does end up in the wrong era, but we do our best. I do remember the time we ended up in the Jurassic era. We were trying to get back to the 1930s. Mr. Turn somewhere, dinosaurs all over the place. Rather frightening. What happened? A lovely woman helped us on our way. You're just as lovely. If you come with me, I can show you Alpha Centauri, fight the Klingons, beat the Romulans, play with Tribbles. With you by my side, we can experience warp speed and wormhole. Oh, well, hold on there. Sounds more like your dream than mine. Even captains have dreams. <laughs> come with me now, and we can make both our dreams come true. Oh, it's a strange and lovely fantasy. But even if this were real, I, I couldn't just leave my parents. One that if I couldn't get back, I, I wonder where my molecules would end up. Oh my God, what am I saying? Even though I want adventure, I don't know that I'd really be that brave anyway. Lost molecules, yeesh. <sighs> Uh-oh, it, it looks like I've stayed too long. I, I, I mean, for some reason, the transport is really, really wearing off. I have to go. I want you to come with me, but we have to leave now. I've been looking for someone for so long. It gets lonely up there, please. I can't, I just can't, at least not now. My parents, and to be honest, I guess I've gotten used to being alone. I really just wanna write, read, Go to the theater, see more Shakespeare when I can, and yes, stay on Earth, at least for now. When I do have a job, although I'm hoping they lay me off and give me a nice severance so my time can be mostly my own, but I'm very flattered that you would want me to join you and maybe mix molecules. Hmm. Yes, well, I understand, though I'm not good at being rejected. And I'm so sorry, but we'll, we'll also have to forget about the 1500s for now. Yet after meeting you, I know I'll have to come back with a stronger transport system. Although, who knows where I'll end up. Meanwhile, don't forget your dreams. And I won't forget mine. James looks at his device. Oh, there's a call for you. I'll uh, send it over to your phone. Jones' cell phone rings. Uh, Jim, James! Wait! Hello? Oh, oh, hey, Joey, I haven't heard from you in a while. I was just talking you, talking about you a little bit ago, about the times we used to go to the theater. Or, oh, just someone. <laughs> no, you didn't wake me, but I sound sleepy. Maybe I, you want to come out and spend some time with mom and dad? Oh, that would be great. I do need a break. When? That would work. Oh, hang on, there's a strange envelope on the floor. I, I don't know where it came from. What? It's, it's, it's a pass to the New York Shakespeare Festival for the week you'll be here. Plane tickets, hotel reservations, all the plays. Wow, I can't even, I know I sound funny, but I, I can't explain. Gotta go, love you. The upstairs bell rings. Uh, yes, Mama, dinner ready soon. Or I may boldly go where no woman has gone before. <laughs> End of play. Lights come up on a kitchen. 
Dee and Susan enter from the garage, and Susan throws the keys on the table. Well, if you don't need me anymore, I'm going home. I'm tired. Dee puts a tea kettle on and gets some cookies out. Honey, why don't you sit down? Let me get you something to eat. Really, Mom? You really think I feel like eating right now? Just sit down, Susie. Don't leave while you're upset. Remember how Dad would never let you drive when you were upset? No, Mom, I don't remember that. I just remember you not wanting me to do anything and blaming it on Dad. You are the one who always wants me to do things your way. Now you don't want me to go, so instead of just asking me to stay, you want, me, you want to somehow make it about Dad. Please stay, Susie. I know you're mad and upset, and I understand that. Just sit down and let's talk. Dee leads Susan to the table and gets her some tea. Don't understand, Mom. I just don't understand why you won't even try. Dad tried. Dad was a fighter. And I know you're a fighter, too. You don't give up. You never give up. You never let us give up. So why are you giving up now? It doesn't even make any sense. Look where all that fighting got your dad, Susie. We all die. Maybe I don't want to go through what he did. Maybe I don't want you to go through what I did. Mom, breast cancer is not the same as pancreatic cancer. People survive breast cancer all the time. My friend, Mary, was in the best shape of her life after breast cancer. She rode 100 mile bike rides. She looks and feels amazing. You are lucky, mom. They caught this early. You could absolutely survive this. I don't want to survive this, Susie. I want to be with your father. What about me, mom? Don't you want to be with me? I miss dad too every single day. You're so fond of remembering the things dad said. Do you know what he said to me? Take care of your mother. Let me take care of you, mom. I'll take you to your chemo appointments. I'll shave my head with you if you want. You can do this. I know you can do it. Please do it for me. Oh, Susie, I'm tired. I'm tired of being sad. I'm tired of missing your father. I will not become a burden to you. Wouldn't it be better for me to die now before I become completely useless? Mom, you will never be a burden to me. I love you. And I can't lose you now. It's only been three months since dad died. You haven't had time to process it yet. And of course, you're still grieving. But mom, I know you. You are an adventurer, a traveler, someone who loves to explore new places and experience new things. You have a lot of years ahead of you to experience so much more of life if you will just get the treatment. Susan, I don't, I can't expect you to understand how I feel. Thing is, I don't want to travel or have new experiences without your father at my side. Without him there, life is meaningless to me. You say I won't be a burden to you, but I would, Susan. Even if breast cancer doesn't kill me, something else will, and who knows how long, slow, and painful it will be. I'll become progressively more dependent on you or someone for help. What happens if I lose my memory? I become incontinent. I would rather die with some dignity than to become some sort of vegetable using up all your inheritance, withering away in some nursing home. Oh, mom. I know you must be scared, but, but many people live productive, healthy, long lives into their 90s. This is a major decision. And if you don't get the surgery, the cancer will spread. There's 
Something else I haven't told you. She made me promise not to say anything. What? What haven't you told me? It's Maddie. Maddie? What? what what's wrong with Maddie? She's pregnant. Pregnant? She made me promise not to tell anybody because she hasn't decided whether or not she'll keep it. First of all, it is not an it. It's a baby. Second of all, of course she'll keep that baby. How can she even consider an abortion? Because, Mom, she's not married and she's not sure if she wants to get married. She just started this new job and you know how ambitious she is. This would be a terrible time for her to have a baby. She's going to abort a baby because it's a bad time. I have never heard anything so selfish. Doesn't she realize how precious life is? If I aborted a pregnancy because it was a bad time, none of you would be here now. What a miracle a baby is. She will not be aborting my first great grandchild. What are you going to say next, Mom, over my dead body? You are here claiming that life is precious, but not willing to save your own. I have had a full life, Susan. We are talking about a new life here. There is a difference. Mom. I hope Maddie keeps the baby, but it is her choice. I cannot force her to keep the baby any more than I can force you to get a mastectomy. Whether she keeps the baby or not, I know this. I need you. I cannot lose you on top of losing my father and dealing with three kids and their problems on my own. I told Maddie I'd help her with the baby. I can't deal with all of this without you. Well, you may have to, honey. There are no guarantees in life. Even with the surgery and the chemo, I may not make it. But will you try? Well, I guess I have to stick around to see this great grandbaby that's coming. Now, don't I? Mom, you can't tell Maddie I told you about the pregnancy. You have to stay out of it. What if Maddie decides to abort? Are you making your decision about whether or not to get your treatments dependent on what she decides to do about the baby? You can't put that kind of pressure on her, Mom. You know that. Don't you understand, Susie? A baby would give me something to live for. It would give me some sense of purpose. Maybe I'd see your dad coming through in the baby's eyes. Don't you see dad in me, mom? Or what about Maddie, Chris, and Julie? Dad is in all of us. Aren't we good enough for you? Can't you decide to stay alive for us? Oh, Susan. The kids are growing up and I'm nothing but an old lady to them. They would much rather be hanging out with their friends and spending time with their grandma. And you have your hands full enough without needing to be shuttling me around to doctor appointments. But the new baby is coming. Well, I might be able to help. It would give me a reason to live. Mom, I keep saying this, but you're not listening. I need you. I will need you more than ever if Maddie decides to abort the baby. I will not be able to go through this much loss in such a short time. You are my mother. You are the only one in this earth who loves me unconditionally. You are the only one who can come close to understanding how much I loved dad. You are the only one who loves Maddie, Chris, and Julie almost as much as I do. Although, at this moment, I'm not understanding how you don't love us all enough to go through these treatments and stay alive for us. Okay. Okay. Okay, Susie. 
I will get the mastectomy and the chemo. If I end up being a senile, cranky old lady that you're stuck with, then, well, you only have yourself to think. You'll stay out of Maddie's business. Me? Stay out of it? Oh, listen, honey. I will let Maddie make her own decision, and I won't make my decision be based on hers. But I am not going to stand back and be silent. I have to at least talk to her about all this. If you want me to live, that means you all get to hear my opinions, like them or not. I want to be an active and valued member of this family, not an invisible old lady who doesn't matter. Of course you matter, Mom. We all value your opinions. Let me talk to Maddie first and let her know that I told you about the pregnancy. Then you can talk to her, but please don't pressure her. She needs to make her own decision about this. You say I always want to do things my way. You say I don't listen to you, but Susie, I think the exact same thing about you. You don't listen to me. You want me to do things your way. You want me to live and you win. I'll try. You weren't even going to tell me about Maddie's pregnancy. Honestly, there is a part of me that's wondering if you're making the whole thing up just to give me a reason to live. Mom, I wouldn't lie about something like that. Yes, I want you to live. I want you to want to live. Oh, Susie. It's so hard to watch someone you love die, but maybe it's worse to see someone you love not even want to live. I'm sorry, I really am. It's just, I felt so empty, so, alone. Your dad, he, he was the only one who really saw me, the only one who listened to me. Without him, well, it's as though I'm already dead. I'm sorry too, mom. You're right. Maybe we're too much alike. Neither of us are listening, and we're both stubborn, independent, feisty women. But you are not alone. I'm here. Yes. You are, aren't you? Don't think I wasn't listening when you said you'd shave your head with me. Oh, uh, are you sure that's what I said? Yes, darling daughter. I listen to every word, even though I disagree with most of them. <sighs> Looks like we're going to have to do some wig shopping. Remember when Samantha from Sex and the City got breast cancer? She had some amazing wigs. And let's get my bike out too. When I talk to Maddie, I want her to know I'm going to be in great shape and will be able to help with the baby. Mom, remember that you said you were going yeah, to... Yeah, yeah, I'll wait for you to talk to her and let her know you've told me about the baby. And yeah, yeah, she probably won't want to listen to what her grandma has to say. After all, she's another stubborn, independent, feisty woman. But you know what? When I talk to Maddie... I'm not going to tell her what I want her to do. I'm going to ask her what she wants to do. And Susan, I'm going to really listen. And if she says she wants to abort? I'll bring a knife with me and tell her I can take care of it then and there. <laughs> Mom, don't joke like that. Okay, okay. I don't know what I'll say if she wants to abort. I hope I'll be able to convince her to keep the baby. 
But if there is one thing this conversation has taught me, it's that we all want to be heard and understood. So I'll start with that. And if that doesn't work, I can always bring the knife, turn the knife on myself and say, over my dead body. End of play. A dark forest, a large oak tree, crisp leaves, fall, a touch of yellow, orange, and red. Carly, a woman in her mid-twenties, bundled up in an oversized sweater, is hiking. John, a man in his thirties, is hiding behind the tree. He jumps out. Boop! Oh, Jesus! What? <laughs> Who are you? What are you doing here? I... What did you do that? I was just trying to- Who are you? I'm, um... You don't know who you are? Yes, I- I'm leaving. Wait! You freaked me out! I'm so sorry. Something out like that? I was just trying to say- It's freaky, you just don't do things like that. Again, sorry. I don't even know you. I didn't mean to scare you. What did you mean to do? I- What? All right, just so you know, I know how to defend myself. I'll kick your freaking ass. Am I still scaring you? I don't mean to. I'm just saying I know how to defend myself. This is not going the way I intended. How did you intend it to go? No, I mean, first you thought I was Jesus, and now- I didn't think you were Jesus. And now you think I'm going to hurt you? Love thy neighbor. You're not gonna hurt me, I'll hurt you. Wait, wait, let, let's back up a couple. I'm really sorry I freaked you out. You're still freaking me out. I just wanted to be friendly. Jumping out from behind a tree in the freaking woods, you call that friendly? Well, I don't call it unfriendly. You're freaky. I'm... I'm just going to go on my way. Okay. Okay. Shoot. Wait! But what if I follow you? What? What if I, I follow you? What for? Well, I may be going the same way. You don't know where I'm going or where I came from. If I'm going the same way you're going, you'll probably think I'm following you and I'll still be freaking you out. You are still freaking me out. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know what else to say. I'm gonna call the police. <laughs> the police? Wait, why? I am, uh, right now. I don't think you'll get cell service. What? We're in a little valley deep in the woods. No cell service. No cell service? Well, believe me, I've tried. One time, I- I, I... I'm gonna try. <laughs> uh, go ahead. Damn. Sorry. <laughs> in any case, my name is- I'm gonna start walking. Okay. And you're not going to follow me. Well. I'm not gonna stay in the woods by myself forever. It's scary. What? Sorry, I, I was just trying to lighten the- You stay put long enough for me to be gone. This is going all wrong. I can make it much worse. I'm not going to steal your purse. Are you rhyming, really? Uh, sorry, I was just kind of hoping. Actually, I heard you singing and so I thought it would be nice, it would be funny to- Nothing about this is funny. Yeah, I mean, this is so weird. I thought it was funny, like when I first jumped out, I thought that was funny, but- No. But just think, we could look back on this meeting years later. Do you remember when we first met in the woods? I stupidly jumped out to say, hello, and you nearly killed me. That would be funny. <laughs> what? It could be funny, years later. Stupid, not funny, scary. I really didn't mean to be scary. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of scrawny, not scary. I, I mean, I'm not like a weakling or anything, but I'm, well, I'm not selling myself well, am I? I've never hit a woman in my entire life. Well, except for Pamela Smith in the first grade, but she kissed me and tried to give me cooties. 
Sorry, I get when I get nervous. I, Look, I, just kinda... I don't know who you are. I just know you're freaking me out, and I just want you to go away and get out of here. I'm gonna get out of here, but I'm going to get out of here the same way you do because that's the way I'm going. Is that okay? Then why didn't you just go that way? Why did you wait for me? Why did you hide behind a freaking tree? I like trees. Sorry, I, I just don't have a good answer. <laughs> you don't have a good answer? Sometimes you stop and just appreciate what's around you. Sometimes you just want to do something fun or spontaneous. Well, I don't normally, but sometimes it's just nice to have someone else with you. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, I hate that phrase. So you have been lying this whole time up until now, and now finally you're not going to lie? No, I'm just saying that- I'm not going to lie implies you've been lying this whole time up until now. Let me be honest. You I... should be honest. Always. You always should be honest. I don't think you should. I don't think you mean that. One time my sister asked me if she looked fat in a dress. I answered honestly and bam, should have lied. Uh, uh, well, at least now we're talking. I'm leaving. I know. All right. I'm going to put it all on the table. I'm leaving. I've been watching you. What? I mean, not like that. Not like weird watching or anything. Yes, weird. You're weird. This whole thing is weird. Well, at least it's no longer freaky. Freaky and weird. No, I mean, it's just every day. Every day? You've been watching me every day? Not on the weekends, mostly. I'm leaving. I notice you always hike the same route. You always... Now this is sounding worse the more I talk. Yes, it's sounding worse. You're a freak. I'm not. Don't come near me. This is all screwed up. Get away. All right, look, I know where you live. No, I don't. I mean... So, so you've been following me home? Yes, sort of, but... Get away from me! I'm... Get away from me! John steps toward her, and she punches him in the face. But he barely reacts. You punched me in the face? But I didn't fall down. Huh. Look, you, um... I... John begins collapsing to the ground. This is what our world has come to. You can't try to get to know someone without being called a freak. You jumped out from behind a tree in the woods. Did you expect me to meet you in a bar? I don't go to bars. I know. You know? Did you expect me to strike up a conversation in the coffee shop? I also go there every morning. You... I never saw you. I'm shy. Well, apparently not today. Did you expect me to find you on a dating app? I don't really use- I figured. What about at the library? You know I spent That's time one of the things that first intrigued me. You saw It's not that big a town. How many people do you encounter every day? We have to have some sort of trust that not everyone is out to get us. In fact, hardly anyone is out to get us. Most people don't even care enough. Two weeks ago, I saw you for the first time walk into the same coffee shop I go into every day, almost at the same time. Then I saw you at the library taking out books that I also like. You, I... <laughs> Then after I was done hiking my favorite trail, I saw you come out from hiking the same trail. Then again, and again, and again, I thought I have to meet this woman, but I'm not gonna try to introduce myself in a public place. It's too much pressure. Everyone is watching. I'm too shy. I'm not Mr. Hey, babe. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't work. <laughs> exactly. But then I kept seeing you. I couldn't get you out of my head. I was losing sleep. And I thought I saw you smile at me a couple of times. Didn't you? You were probably just being nice, but I thought... You thought you'd jump out from behind a tree. In the woods. The dark woods. What if I had a gun? I just wanted to meet you. Well? My name's John. I'm Carly. End of play.
lights up on an urban porch in some disrepair. The house numbers hang from a tall, decorative, but rusting metal fence. A realtor's just sold sign hangs next to it. A man and a woman are sitting on the worn porch steps next to a couple of small moving boxes, late morning or early afternoon. This is so real. What, other people living in our house? Yeah, and just you know, being back here. But what nice people to call us to get these boxes. They could have just put them in the dumpster. So nice. You think they mind that we're sitting on the steps? Where else are we gonna wait for the boxes? Um, the Uber is 10 minutes away. Let's get a selfie in front of the house before we leave. <laughs> Mary, it's like an overgrown dollhouse. How did 10 people share one bathroom? I mean, how did we live here in such relative, I don't know, bliss? What? Bliss? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we had an idyllic childhood, right? I mean, compared to most people. <laughs> Mark, I don't know what family you grew up in. What do you mean? I mean, we may have had the same parents, but we grew up in different families. What are you talking about? By the time I came along, mom and dad were not the same parents you had. Right, well, hopefully they just got better at it. They made all their mistakes early on. That's why you turned out so great. Do you really think that? Yeah, I do think you're great. You're hardworking, smart, you're compassionate. No, you're... not me. <laughs> About mom and dad making their parenting mistakes early on. Sure. Practice makes perfect, doesn't it? <sighs> if only it were that simple. I don't think parenting works like that. Mark, let's play a game. You described three activities you did as a kid that included our siblings or our parents or both. And so will I, just for fun. You go first. Okay. Okay, one, I was a Cub Scout and mom was our dead mother and we had Cub Scout meetings in the attic. How sweet. I had no idea you were a Cub Scout, but yeah. I can picture mom as the den mother. <laughs> yes, and Two, every 4th of July, mom and dad took us to the city park with picnic blankets at dusk and we watched the fireworks. And afterwards, we went to the ice cream parlor on the way back home. Okay, three, um, I like this game. <laughs> uh, grandpa used to wake me up at dusk on summer mornings and we'd make pumpernickel toast and we sat in the yard watching the sun come up. All right, your turn. Okay, one, your college graduation picnic where you let me ride on your shoulders pretty much the whole time. That's one of my first memories. And I also threw up in the car on the way home. <laughs> <laughs> okay, two, grandpa sneaking out of the house and getting lost and all of us, not you, you lived in Boston by then, scouring the neighborhood looking for him like it was a scavenger hunt. And three, Sammy and I locking ourselves in mom and dad's bedroom after school so that Joey couldn't beat the crap out of us. Are you kidding me? No, I would not make that up. Surely you knew he was a bully. I just, I know he wasn't easy to be around. Well, that's an understatement. Luckily we have a big family so it's not always obvious. But I never go near Joey at family gatherings. Have you ever noticed that? I basically just pretend he isn't there. I don't speak to him, don't plan to, haven't spoken to him in years. Of course, I noticed he's not your favorite because I know I am. But Mary, all joking aside, don't you have good memories from childhood besides my graduation picnic? Look, Mark, I'm not mad at them, but now that I have kids, I think about how I was raised. I was invisible. You weren't. I'm happy for you. But it's like they had two sets of kids. The early ones and the later ones. I never thought about it like that. Think about it now. Parents monitor their children. Physically, obviously. Like, where is my child? Is she safe? Is she getting enough sleep? Does she have a cold? 
they did that. But you monitor their emotional state too. You look for clues. Yes. And when they're small, you snuggle with them and you read books to them. <laughs> yes. Mark, think about it. We were separated by 16 years and also six other kids. By the time I came along, mom and dad were burned out, ground down, outnumbered. I'm not saying they didn't care about us younger kids, but unless one of us was arrested or disappeared or came home bloody, all of which eventually happened, they just assumed everything was okay. Do you know you're the only one who ever read books to me when I was little? Oh my God, you were neglected. You're just realizing this now? Benignly, benignly neglected, but neglected. And Mark, this house was so disgusting when I was little. The house was neglected too. They never did anything to keep it up. Okay, number one, this house is charming. I would have bought it myself if I didn't have a life halfway across the country. Stop. You wouldn't. It should have been scrapped. And Mark, I need your help. I want mom to move in with me now. Or she can live with you. No one else has the space or financial stability. Except for Joey. And she cannot keep living with him. Look, siblings fight. Siblings tease. I fought with Joey, too. I don't let my kids tease each other. And I have real trauma from that bullying. I'm just saying... I don't even know how we got into this. But it needs to come out in the open because our brother is unfit to look after mom. She can live with me or she can live with you. Or we can talk about assisted living. But over my dead body, will she continue to live with that brother? Wait, did you ever tell mom and dad that Joey bullied you? They had a lot going on, so I kept my head down. I was stoic. But it caught up with me and it took its toll. And mom will never admit it, but she knows there's something wrong with him up here. Well, I can't argue he is difficult. Look, Mark. I don't want to psychoanalyze a brother who's not here to defend himself and who I don't speak to anyway, but I'll just tell you, I was bullied. This isn't about me. We need to discuss mom. Mom is fine. There's no emergency here. We should be glad. Joey's so helpful. Let's just appreciate that he took her in after the house was sold. He's helpful? We should appreciate? He bosses her around. She doesn't let anyone else treat her like he does. Let me give you an example. She was planning to go to her friend's funeral the other day. It was all agreed. And then at the last minute, he refused to take her. What do you think of that? I'm sure it was just a misunderstanding. No, Mark. And you know she's not a complainer. I only know this because I asked her about the funeral, so she told me why she didn't go. <sighs> Look, these are the clues, Mark. We need to get mom out of there. Her phone buzzes. Uber's here. Wait, no selfie? End of play. A purgatory for the nearly dead. It could be anywhere, a hospital or hospice or home. Lights come up on a hospital bed. In the bed is a woman. All we can see of her is her bare feet sticking out from under the sheets and the tubing to an intravenous drip and oxygen source that keep her alive. She lies completely flat, except that her chest heaves towards the heavens with a few pronounced gasps of dark, throaty breaths. After a few moments of the woman's agonizing breaths, a man tiptoes into the room dressed in Elizabethan attire. He assesses the barely alive woman with curiosity, circling her bed on tiptoes 
then bends over her. I say, I do love nothing in the world so well as you. Is not that strange? Come on, B. Now, what's your line? I would rather hear a dog bark at a crow than a man swear he loves me. No, B. Not that line. The other one. I don't like that line. It's sentimental and it comes when the play is nearly over. All right, then. He takes her hand. Suddenly, she bolts upright as if he had blown life into her. Good Lord Jesus, Ben, what are you doing here? I can't bear seeing you suffer like this. You've been dead for 16 years. But I can still feel you when you are suffering. He raises a hospital bed so she can sit up. Oh, I'm so exhausted. I know you are. It's really you. Is that how you dress up there in heaven? Oh, <laughs> not all the time. But the costume department is excellent. Ben holds her until the coughing subsides, then steps back. You look too good to be dead. Life is good. I, I mean, life being dead. It, it's been good. It's treated me well. Well, you died on Christmas Day, for God's sake. I'm sure you got special treatment up there for that. It sure surprised me how suddenly it happened. Surprised you? What about Oliver? I wanted to kill you, but you were dead. You had the audacity to go to sleep on Christmas Eve and wake up dead. I mean, poor Oliver found you dead. It was a dramatic exit. Selfish of me, I know. But I also know you've forgiven me. Oh, that's humble of you to say. He touches his ruff affectionately, then runs her hands down the fabric of his sleeve. Sixteen years went by so quickly. He sits now on the side of her bed. Is that good? I don't know. Have you missed me? What kind of stupid question is that? Of course I've missed you. Then come be with me. Yeah. It's hard work dying. Not all of us are as lucky as you. But you're really struggling, B. Oliver's coming, and I promised him I'd be here. Where the heck is Oliver? He rises suddenly and anxiously paces. What? You can see me from up there, but you don't see your son? I actually never see either one of you, unless it's an emergency. It, I'm very busy. Doing what? Theater like we used to do before Oliver was born. You act in heaven. There's a lot more opportunity now that I'm dead and I don't have to worry about paying the bills. You would love it, B. There were so many talented people to play with, with no place to go. I got to play Hamlet to Audrey Hepburn's Ophelia. And I played Stanley Kowalski. Who was Blanche? Vivian Lee! Oh. But I want to do it again with you. I think I'm hallucinating. No. Being dead is good. Where is Oliver? And what is taking him so long? He lives in Australia now. What? What, the, what took him there? He did it. What we never did, Ben. He became an actor, for real. He makes a living at it. In Australia? He met a woman. <laughs> when was this? Well, I don't know, a couple of years after you died, I think. So he left you too? He didn't leave me. He visits and we call each other. Ben, you're not going to believe this, but he has his own theater now. 
just like we always dreamed of having. He did it. I'm so proud of him. Aren't you proud? What's the matter? I don't want to wait another 30, 40 years to see him again. I'm sorry. Should I not have told you? I thought you'd be so happy to know. What is taking him so long? He's in a production. He must have an understudy. I told him to finish the run. But you're in pain. Does he know that? Does he know how much pain you are in? What part is he playing that is so great he can't leave to be with his dying mother? Ben, stop it. I'm going to send you back from you where you came from. Now stop it. You need to come home now. When I'm ready. This is the first time in my 16 years dead that I have been called down here. I don't get called down here unless it is an emergency. I'm going when I'm ready. But no one should have to suffer this much. How come you never told me that in childbirth? <laughs> ben, just say goodbye to me. We never got to do that, did we? But I came to take you home, not to say goodbye. I'm the ambassador for the dead. I, I came to tell you it's really not that bad being dead. Thank you. That's very generous of you. But we never said goodbye, Ben. That's why I called you. You called me? I think so. Then you don't believe you're going to see me up there? Well, I have no idea. Just tell me when Oliver is coming. Why? You're dead. You can't see him. No, we can get this over with and you can come home with me. What if you his plane should... crashes? You should go now. Come on, B. Come home with me. No, no, no. That's not why I called you. It isn't? I have no idea if I'm going to see you. I needed to say goodbye. That sounds so final. You should go now. Will you just say Beatrice's line to me? The one at the end of the play. If I see you on the other side, I will. What, what do you mean, if? Tell me when Oliver is coming. His play ends December 22nd, and then he has to fly here, so he'll be here Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve. Not again. You, you said yourself that it was awful that I died on Christmas. Oh, it was awful. Heartbreaking. And then, well, then Oliver grew up and God, if he didn't turn out to be just like you. But this time, I'm going to say goodbye. Okay. He takes a few steps away from B. I think you called me back so I could say I'm sorry for leaving you so suddenly. <laughs> Here I was thinking that I came back to woo you into being my leading lady again. I would love nothing more. Then you will, soon. Soon. Ben starts to walk away, then turns. We were such a feisty Beatrice and Benedict, weren't we? <laughs> we were. Goodbye, B. Goodbye, Ben. Ben turns and exits. I love you with so much of my heart that none is left to protest. End of play. <laughs>